last lecture. Yes, sir. Are there any questions about last lecture? Yes, sir. I tend to uh, switch them around, I fear, but uh, uh, when in, any in any given subsection, I try and establish a uniform convention. I think when I was discussing Green's functions, I had a plus i k dot x in the x Fourier transform and a minus i k dot x in the in the momentum space in the d4k Fourier transform. In any given argument, I try and keep my convention straight. But since I keep giving away my notes, I have no idea when I sit down to write something new what convention I used before. I always try and keep a 2 pi to the fourth with the dk and no 2 pi to the fourth with the dx. OK? Uh, well, sometimes it is said that because quantum electric dynamics needs to be renormalized, um, it can't be the right theory, and it must fail at four distances. Do you agree with that? I have no idea of what the logic of that statement means. <laughs> I mean, suppose, presume at some future date, um, that depends on how strange you're willing to admit the world is. Certainly, it's a little nervous to deal with the theory that involves um, uh, infinite quantities in its Heisenberg equations of motion, the bare charge and the bare mass. Suppose at some future date, however, the constructive field theorists conquer quantum electrodynamics in the sense of establishing a rigorous proof that shows if you put in a cutoff, I mean, the equations of motion have unique, well-defined solutions. And uh, those solutions have a definite limit as the cutoff goes to infinity, presuming you, you adjust the bare coupling constants and the bare masses appropriately as functions of the cutoff. That is to say, they prove non-perturbatively what has been proved in perturbation theory. So in that sense, they construct a mathematically well-defined theory, albeit through a limiting procedure. First putting in a cutoff, then choosing the bare masses and coupling constants to be appropriate functions of the cutoff, and then letting the cutoff go to infinity. Now there it is. It's a mathematically well-defined theory that obeys all the general assumptions you'd want a quantum field theory to obey. It's got local fields. They commute for space-like separations. It's Lorentz invariant. It has a particle spectrum, et cetera. Are you going to reject it out of hand just because you don't like the fact that it's defined through a limiting procedure? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're nervous about that sort of thing, but uh, I mean, that was uh, Bishop Barclay's uh, 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 ob objection to the calculus. <laughs> <laughs> that it was, uh, you know. <laughs> this is just a question. Was it the limiting? No, because he preceded, he preceded Weierstrass historically, yes. <laughs> it was dividing by infinitesimals. Yeah. Yes, he said infinitesimals didn't exist. But that was later reformulated in terms of a limiting procedure, and you can reformulate this in terms of a limiting procedure. I don't know. Um, it, I don't think it's profitable to worry about questions like that in the abstract. If someone comes up with a theory that doesn't involve any infinite, that is not just renormalizable, but actually finite, that doesn't involve any infinite quantities at all, if, we can cons if anyone could ever construct such a theory, then it would be a reasonable question to ask, is that a, um, is that a legitimate um, um, alternative to quantum electrodynamics? But uh, in the absence of such a theory, I don't know of any such theory, and I don't know of any, any uh, viable ideas for constructing such a theory. Uh, might be, might be God did things that way with limiting procedures. <coughs> and maybe even if there is a cutoff, if, if it may be at some distance so small that uh, nobody knows it, it might as well not be there for all practical purposes. It might be that gravity, in its mysterious way, does something strange, although nobody knows how it could. But we can do dimensional analysis and see that uh, the characteristic uh, length of gravity is what, 10 to the minus 38 centimeters? Does anyone remember? 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is uh, you know 10 orders of magnitude shorter than the current experimentally accessible range of distances, even with extreme high energy machines. And um, if there is a cutoff at that distance, uh, who cares? Uh, 
So um, I think, uh, you know, unless one, is in, unless one has, thinks one has a real idea of how to construct a theory that's finite and not just renormalizable, I don't think it's particularly fruitful to worry about questions of that sort. People who make statements of that sort in the literature are people who don't have any other things to say in the literature. <laughs> <laughs> Are there uh, <laughs> other questions? Okay, at the end of the last lecture, I had the formula for the superficial degree of divergence. External Bose lines, external Fermi lines, uh, a four. plus the sum of the uh, degrees of divergence of the individual interactions, and the degree of divergence of the inter individual interaction is the number of derivatives, plus 3 halves the number of Fermi lines at the vertex, plus the number of Bose lines at the vertex, minus 4. Uh, now, I'd like to uh, make some remarks about this. One of them is fairly trivial, but uh, since it's, uh, people use this alternative language in the literature, I should take the trouble to explicitly make the remark that for the type of theories we are considering, the uh, theories of uh, uh, scalar fields and direct by spinner fields, uh, the degree of divergence is connected with the dimensionality of the interaction, or equivalently with the dimensionality of the coupling constant that multiplies the interaction in a relatively simple way. We can see that by elementary dimensional analysis. Firstly, the derivative operator has dimensions of length to the minus 1, or in the units we are using, where mass and length have inverse dimensions, dimensions of mass. Secondly, the Lagrange operator has dimensions of length to the minus 4, or mass to the fourth, universally, because the derivative of Lagrange in d4x is the action, which has dimensions of Planck's constant, which that is to say dimensionless. Thus, a scalar field, because the Lagrangian for a scalar field enters in with two derivatives and two phi's, the first term, d mu phi squared, a scalar field has dimensions of mass, and the spinner field has dimensions of mass to the 3 halves because it's psi bar d slash psi. Thus, if we look at the dimension of an interaction Lagrangian, not counting the dimensionless coupling, dimensionful coupling constant that multiplies it, just counting up the dimension factors from the psi bar and the psi and the derivatives. Not counting, how did I write it? The dimension of gi, whatever the coupling constant is, just as the remaining part. We find we have a power of m that is 3 halves from every Fermi field, one from every Bose field, Bosch field, and one from every derivative. That is to say, delta i plus. Um, have I done this wrong? Delta i plus four. Um, yeah, mm, and that's wrong. <laughs> Delta i plus 4, if delta i is 0, that's right. If delta i is 0, the dimension is 4. That's right. <laughs> Thus, uh, if you know, if you remember the rules for dimensions, you also remember the rules for computing the degree of divergence delta i in powers of mass. <coughs> A um, equivalently. If you count the coupling constant in the range matters so the whole Lagrange density has dimensions m to the fourth, the dimension of the coupling constant is delta i in units of inverse mass. Two ways of saying the same thing. <coughs> a 
An interaction is said to be of renormalizable type the degree of divergence is less than or equal to 0. These are interactions which are at least in principle not disastrous, not non-renormalizable. As we end up more, put in more and more of these interactions, we do not send up delta. We do not send up the superficial degree of divergence and therefore necessitate more and more counter terms. It is possible to make a complete list of these interactions in four dimensions. As we see, the minimum case of delta is minus 3. Minus 4 is, in principle, possible with no derivatives, no fermions, and no bosons. But that's not much of an interaction. That's just adding a constant to the Lagrangian. Therefore, we'll start out there. There, the only possibility is a term linear in a scalar field. Uh, of, I will use phi and psi generically. When I write phi in a theory with 21 scalar fields in the Lagrangian, of course, it could be any linear combination of 21 such terms. Delta equals minus 2. We can get by with one scalar field and one derivative, which is not particularly uh, interesting, since that's not Lorentz invariant and also vanishes by integration by parts. Or, with two scalar fields, so we could have phi squared. Again, it could be phi 1, phi 2, phi, you know, if there's a bunch of fields. Delta equals minus 3, things become a bit, minus 1, thank you. Things become a bit richer. We could have phi cubed, and we could have psi bar psi, or if our theory is not parity conserving, psi bar gamma phi psi a kind of counter term which would come up in um, the a theory with uh, non-parity conserving vertices. The, um, finally, these three kinds of interactions with delta strictly less than zero are sometimes called super renormalizable. That means that although they require infinite counter terms, as we see from the formulas, in general, they only require a finite number of infinite counter terms in order and perturbation theory. When you put in enough of these interactions, d becomes negative and no new counter terms are required. Super renormalizable theories are, of course, much nicer than renormalizable theories because although the perturbation uh, series for the uh, where is, is uh, infinite in extent and infinite powers of g, at least the divergent part of the perturbation series terminates. But unfortunately, at least in four dimensions, the only super renormalizable theories we can get are either trivial theories, in which these are the only interactions, or a theory in which the energy is unbounded below if we allow this interaction without a 5 fourth term to compensate for it. In, uh, in uh, less, no, less dimensions, in less than four-dimensional space-time, of course, the counting is rather different. And I may give you a homework problem at the beginning of the second semester to, count it, to do the same counting in dimensions other than four. And you can find theories that do have sensible energy spectra that are super renormalizable and are therefore nice models to look at if you want to do some rigorous mathematics and prove that a quantum field theory exists. You have a divergence problem to handle but it's not such a severe divergence problem as you have in realistic four-dimensional theories. Finally, we have delta equals zero, the really renormalizable types of interactions. There we can have phi the fourth, d mu phi squared, two derivatives and two scalar fields, psi bar d slash psi, the normal term that arises in the free Lagrangian, psi bar d slash gamma phi psi, which might occur as a counter term in a theory with parity violating interactions, a parity violating analog of the Z3, Z2 counter term. And finally, 
the two kinds of Yukawa couplings, psi bar psi phi, the one to a scalar field, and psi bar gamma phi psi phi. That's it, that completes the list. And that is to say, it completes the list as far as the fields we have talked about. In the second semester, we will worry about what happens when you allow for vector fields and how this formalism is extended. As you see, renormalizability is a very severe criterion. And it's one of the striking differences between uh, relativistic local quantum mechanics, that is to say quantum field theory, and non-relativistic quantum mechanics. In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, even um, once you have specified the dynamical variables, say you are still studying a system of 27 particles of spin 14, and so you know what the dynamical variables are, you have a very large, there is no a priori constraint of any sort on the interactions between them. There may be two body forces, they may be arbitrary potentials, there may be three body forces, four body forces, etc. And there's a very large amount of freedom. As far as one knows, there is no general criterion one can apply that restricts in any significant way the interactions between the particles. You don't want them to be too singular, so the energy will be bounded below and so on, but aside from that, anything goes. In um, quantum field theory, if you accept renormalizability as a criterion that distinguishes sensible theories from nonsensical theories, or at least if you accept it as a criterion that distinguishes those theories about which we can say something significant beyond lowest order and perturbation theory from those theories for which we cannot, things are much more restricted. Once you have told me the number of, of uh, spinless fields and the number of direct by spinner fields in the theory, I have only a small number, only a finite number of free parameters which I can adjust the coefficients of these renormalizable couplings. The, um, by the way, one of the test problems involves a non-renormalizable theory, but don't worry about that. We're just, you're just asked to look at it in lowest order perturbation theory. There's no counter terms. Um, if I had asked you on the test to compute radiative corrections in that non-renormalizable theory, then you would have the right to throw the test in my face. <laughs> You may feel you have that right anyway, once you see These are interactions of renormalizable type. That is to say, they do not generate an infinite sequence of counter terms. However, in normal parlance, we make use the word renormalizable in a slightly stronger sense. We not only want the number of counter terms generated to be finite, but we want them all to be interpretable as redefinitions of parameters that already occur in our initial Lagrangian. I will call this, this is sometimes in the literature called a strictly renormalizable theory. counter terms are of the same form as terms in the original Lagrangian. For example, if we take a theory of a scalar field plus those, of course, that can be generated from them by rescaling the fields, such as uh, so, uh, wave function renormalization counter terms. The, um, this is required so that all the counter terms that arise in every order of the Bogolyubov Bogol iterative procedure can be reinterpreted as corrections to the, quote, bare parameters, unquote, of the theory. Thus, for example, in the strict sense of renormalizability, an interaction between our good old friend Yukawa theory, as it stands, is not a renormalizable theory, and I should put a G here, the parameter that is going to be adjusted, because as we can see from our formula, or just by counting, This 
graph for meson-meson scattering is logarithmically divergent. D4 k over k to the fourth, or equivalently, delta equals zero, B e equals four, F e equals zero. On the other hand, if I add a phi the fourth interaction, I have a phi fourth counter term that can be used to cancel out this divergence, and then it is easy to check. Indeed, I will give you general theorems that will enable you to check that. That uh, the theory is then strictly renormalizable. The only divergent graphs are those that can be reinterpreted as redefining the parameters, and that can be interpreted as redefining the parameters in the Lagrangian. Thus, there is no point in our of talking about Yukawa theory as a one-parameter theory. In fact, in the sense of renormalization theory, it is a two-parameter theory. You have to give the independently the Yukawa coupling and the phi-fourth coupling. Is this distinction clear to everyone here? It is possible to give some general theorems that characterize large classes of strictly renormalizable theories. For example, given a set of size and phi's, you have to tell me how many they are. First result. I'll give three results in a row. The most general Lagrangian involving all interactions And here I'm going to put a little parentheses because I'm shortly going to stage a, state a second theorem that restricts that. <laughs> and I don't want to write a long sentence all over again on the board. <laughs> of a dimension less than or equal to 4, equivalently delta less than or equal to 0, is strictly renormalizable. How do I prove that? I prove it from this formula here, sticking some of the terms over onto the other side. minus 3 halves Fe plus, I'm sorry, plus Be minus 4 equals sum of Ni delta I. Now, if I'm looking at a Griffin graph in which I encounter a divergence, Fe tells me the number of Fermi fields I have to put into my counter term. Be tells me the number of boson fields, and D tells me uh, the maximum number of derivatives I have to add, so to track the appropriate terms in the Taylor expansion. Thus, I see that delta, but this is just the formula that enters into the definition of delta i. It's the same combination. Here it is. Thus, the delta of the counter terms is always less than or equal to sum of ni delta i. Is this point clear? It's elementary algebra. I say less than or equal because I have to subtract all terms in the Taylor series up to order d. <clears throat> Thus, if I have the most general interaction, the sum of all monomials, with delta less than 0, every counter term I introduce will be a monomial with delta less than 0. And therefore, it can be reinterpreted as a renormalization of the coefficient of one of the monomials in my original Lagrangian. Is that there any questions? Result 2. Um, also true 
if parentheses above is replaced by by <coughs> consistent with some internal symmetry or parity. That is to say, this is because if I, unless I am so perverse as to choose a cutoff procedure that all by itself violates my internal symmetry or parity, which I certainly don't have to do, then uh, parity violating uh, graphs or internal symmetry violating graphs will vanish and therefore will induce, no, even though they may have a superficial degree of divergence greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, I will certainly have not, not have to make any subtractions for them because they are zero and therefore all terms in their Taylor expansion are zero. <laughs> Thus, for example, Yukawa theory with a five-fourth interaction a conventional four factorial there, is by this criterion strictly renormalizable because it represents the most general interaction between these kinds of fields consistent with parity. In principle, if it weren't for parity invariance, I could have a psi bar psi phi counter term and I could have a, uh, a phi cube counter term or a term linear in phi as a counter term, but those would all violate parity. Oh, yes, right. That's not violates Lorentz invariance. <laughs> I'm assuming Lorentz invariant interactions. Likewise, uh, the corresponding uh, theory for um, uh, that is isospin and parity invariant, the Yukawa theory. n bar tau i gamma phi, I should put, n dot phi. That was our old Yukawa interaction. Now, just as before, we have to add the possibility of a phi-fourth interaction, but the only one that is consistent with isospin invariance, four phi is the only way I can make an isoscalar without introducing derivatives, is phi dot phi squared. This, it is easy to see, is the most general interaction of this form, only involving terms with dimension less than or equal to zero and consist, dim, less than or, dimension less than or equal to four, delta less than or equal to zero, which is invariant under both parity and under isospin rotations, and is therefore is strictly renormalizable. The only kinds of counter terms we will encounter are counter terms of the same sort. Are there any questions about any of this? It's really very simple. Of course, the reason it's very, really very simple is because I cheated on you. I told you Hepp's theorem without telling you the proof. <laughs> if I had gone through the proof of Hepp's theorem, you wouldn't think it was such a simple subject. But once you have that big theorem, everything else falls out. A third result is about symmetry breaking. This is actually a new result, although in this way of organizing it, it seems like a trivial consequence. It actually was not discovered until 1970 by Zamancic. Also true if we allow all possible Symmetry breaking interactions 
action, interactions that don't obey the internal symmetry of dimension less than or equal to n, where n equals 1, 2, or 3. That is to say, it's really three results with n equals 1, n equals 2, or n equals 3. The point here <clears throat> is that if you have an asymmetric interaction as well as a symmetric one, but the asymmetric interaction is of low dimension, that is to say, has a negative delta, by this formula, it will only introduce asymmetric counterterms that also have a negative delta. Thus, if you have a, the only interaction in your theory that breaks the symmetry has, for example, delta equals minus 2 or less, you will only get counterterms that violate your symmetry considerations of delta equals minus 2 or less. And therefore, you will never generate the need for an infinite subtraction with a higher value of delta. Thus, for such uh, symmetry breakings are called, uh, sometimes called, super renormalizable symmetry breaking. Or sometimes called soft in the literature symmetry breaking. I don't know why they call it soft, but they call it soft. Not hard. It's <laughs> Thus, for example, if we break the symmetry here by adding this, I put this in the interaction, I could just as well put it in the free Lagrangian, an unequal mass term for the pions, let's say epsilon. Um, phi naught squared, giving the pi naught a different mass than the pi plus and the pi minus. That is a symmetry breaking term with delta equals minus 2 of dimension 2. And indeed, it is the only possible symmetry breaking term of dimension 2, two or less, consistent with parity and charge conjugation, etc. And therefore, uh, this will never generate any counterterms except counterterms of the same form, parity consistent with parity charge conservation and charge conjugation, none of which it breaks. <clears throat> Thus, for example, is perfectly consistent with, with renormalization within the framework of meson nucleon theory to say that the uh, theory is completely isospin symmetric except for a difference between the bare mass of the charged pion and the neutral pion. The bare masses of the nucleons are the same because that counterterm is never forced on you. That's dimension minus dimension three, delta equals minus one, and all the couplings, which are dimension four, bare couplings remain symmetric. Unfortunately, although this is a cute result, it does not solve anything about what we want to say about nature, because in nature we would like to say the bare masses are all the same, and it's the electromagnetic interactions that make the difference. And although I haven't talked about electromagnetism and vector fields yet, that interaction is of dimension four. So it's exactly the opposite, psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. You might expect it's of dimension four. The, you might, it's exactly the, uh, this is exactly, this theorem unfortunately is just what we don't want. We want something that goes the other way. And uh, that requires uh, much more straining. And it's not an easy, trivial result like the Monsik's theorem. It requires setting up a quite complicated theory, so that will happen. It can be done, and we may talk about it in the second semester. But it requires a much more complicated theory than electromagnetism. It requires what is called a spontaneously broken gauge field theory, a very popular objects recently. Um, are there any questions about any of this, about the Zamancic rule? It is, the Zamancic rule is useful in other cases if we get to talk about chiral symmetries, which we may. It's, uh, there are many popular models like the sigma model. That's a famous model of uh, pion nucleon interactions that possess a so-called chiral symmetry. You'll find out what that is. 
I'm going to have to talk very fast in the second semester, <laughs> that uh, has a, um, in which the uh, symmetry is broken by a term linear in one of the scalar fields only, and that is, of course, consistent with the Zamansic rule. That's a term with dimension one, and the only possible kind of term with dimension one is a term linear in scalar fields. This concludes my discussion for the moment of renormalization. Of course, we will have to return to the topic when we discuss electrodynamics, which we're certain, we are certainly going to do. That I already know in the second <laughs> semester. <laughs> but uh, for the moment, that's all I'm going to say about renormalization and theories involving spinner fields and scalar fields only. Are there any questions? Mm. In the remaining <clears throat> 50 minutes, I would like to get a flying start on the second semester by starting a new topic, which in fact I unquestionably will not complete until the second semester, and go on in our catalog of free field theories. We have done scalar fields and spinner fields. The next step is obviously to do vector fields. This will mainly be an orgy of indices. As the spin gets higher and higher, as degrees of freedom get more and more, we have more and more indices to keep track of. So in the, there will be a lot of raising and lowering of indices. But other than that, it will be pretty much a rerun of what we did for the scalar field and the spinner field. So free, real vector field. I do the real case because, as in the scalar case, the extension to complex fields is, is uh, trivial. A mu is what I'll call it in honor of the most famous such free real vector field, the electrodynamic field. We will begin just as in the scalar case, or in that matter in the spinner case, we will write, um, fortunate, fortunately, we can uh, short circuit a lot of the stuff we did for spinners. I presume you all know the Lorentz transformation properties of a vector, so I don't have to get them from the general theory of the Lorentz group. <laughs> and I will just write down the first step, the most general Lagrangian, quadratic in A, no more than two derivatives. That will define the classical field theory. I will then restrict the parameters by the condition of positivity of the energy. And then I will canonically quantize. And then I hope the lecture will be over. Now, <clears throat> with um, no derivatives, let's start counting. With no derivatives, I can obviously build only one Lorentz invariant form, a mu, a mu. That's it. With one derivative, I can build nothing. Because with three vector indices, one from the derivatives and two for the fields, there's no possible way I can make a scalar. I always have an uncontracted index around someplace. With two derivatives, things get more complicated. At first glance, uh, certainly by integration by parts, I can always arrange matters so that one field is differentiated once and the other field is differentiated once. I can certainly build this. That's a possibility. Here's another. And here's apparently a, um, a fourth, D, a third, excuse me, D, D nu A mu, D nu A nu. That is to say, I can either sum one of the indices associated with the differentiation object with the field on which it acts, and then the other one has to be summed that way to make a scalar. Or I can sum them with something different. If 
I sum it with something different, I can either sum it with the other derivative, or I can sum it with the other field. As far as the Lagrangian goes, the third one is the same as the second one, because by integration by parts, I can turn this into this thing, just by switching the two derivatives around, integrating by parts. So therefore, I, in fact, have only got three poss two possible terms emerging in the, uh, in the Lagrangian. That's slightly more complicated than the scalar field, where we have two possible terms, but not that much more complicated. Mm. Therefore, as always, <coughs> I can rescale the field to turn the coefficients of one of these terms into whatever I please up to a sign. So I will write my most general form of Lagrangian. A plus or minus 1 half will turn out later to be convenient to scale things so the coefficient of this term is plus or minus a half plus some coefficient times this thing, plus some coefficient times this thing. And that defines our most general theory in terms of the two real coefficients, a and b. <clears throat> Are there any questions about what I have done so far? Yes? Uh, that was, well, uh, there, yes, you could do something, but that wouldn't be a free field theory because it would have a trilinear interaction between the vector fields. We're doing free Lagrangians now, means linear equations of motion. That would have to be considered when we start writing down interactions. <coughs> now, the uh, next stage is, of course, to vary the Lagrangian and derive the equations of motion. Um, all of these terms are quadratic in the field, and therefore the one-half will be canceled in the, by the variation. From varying this one, I get d mu, I'll put in a minus sign. The plus or minus one-half is, of course, irrelevant for the equations of motion. Um, I see I've arranged things in a jolly way with sometimes a mu and sometimes a nu. I shouldn't really do that. That makes life harder for you. Let me relabel these indices so it's always a mu and at least wherever I can do that. I get minus d nu d nu a mu, varying with respect to a upper mu, and integrating by parts, minus a d uh, mu d nu a nu, plus b a mu equals 0. That comes from varying the Lagrangian and raising and lowering indices indiscriminately, but I suppose you're used to that by now. <laughs> now, this is a messy equation, which is rather hard to see what the particle, what particles of what mass are being described here. But let's just blithely go ahead and look for plane wave solutions. A mu is some vector I'll call E mu times e to the minus i k dot x. <clears throat> the, um, then I get from here plus k squared e mu. From here, minus a k mu k dot e. That's the divergence operator. And a plus, I'm sorry, because i k times i k. And from here, plus b e mu equals 0. Now, uh, this equation I can find two kinds of solutions for. I can find four-dimensional longitudinal solutions, where k e is aligned along k. Or I can find four-dimensional transverse solutions, where e is perpendicular to k. 
I'll demonstrate that. That really comes out of the invariance of the equation, but it's easier just to show it by demonstration. E equals k. That's a possibility. I could write a plane wave where the vector in front is proportional to k. Can I solve the equation for that? Well, E equals k. This term and this term and this term are all proportional. So I simply have k squared plus a k squared plus b equals 0. Therefore, I have a mass. This is simply a uh, gives us our usual relativistic k squared relation. Uh, did I make a mistake? No. This gives us our usual relativistic equation. k squared equals mu longitudinal squared, which is equal to b over 1 plus a. On the other hand, I can also try and find solutions of this equation, which are four-dimensionally transverse. Yes, indeed there should. Thank you. Uh, in which e dot k equals 0. In this case, the central term drops out of the equation. And I have k squared plus b equals 0, or k squared equals mu transverse squared equals minus b. Thus, the general theory we have written down is capable of subscribing two kinds of oscillations, four-dimensionally transverse and four-dimensionally longitudinal. It's rather like the three-dimensional theory of an elastic solid in that way. The longitudinal oscillations have one mass, and the transverse oscillations have the other. Now, in general, we're interested in describing one would expect on quantization, since a longitudinal oscillation becomes a longitudinal oscillation under a Lorentz transform, and a transverse oscillation becomes a transverse oscillation under a Lorentz transform, that upon quantization, the longitudinal oscillations would correspond to scalar particles, one degree of freedom, and the transverse oscillations would correspond to spin 1, or as we say, three-dimensional vector particles, three degrees of freedom, because there are three solutions to this equation. Given a given vector, there are always three vectors perpendicular, three independent vectors perpendicular to it. This should really be no surprise to us, because we already know that we could describe a uh, theory of an ordinary scalar meson in terms of a vector field to wit the gradient of the scalar field we talked about so much. So the fact that, uh, in general, we can describe not only a vector particle, but also a scalar particle by a theory of a vector field should not surprise us. We can do it, but we don't particularly want to do it. We'd like to get a theory that, when we quantize it, would have described vector particles only. That is to say, have no <coughs> longitudinal oscillations. Is it possible to arrange other parameters in our Lagrangian to suppress these longitudinal oscillations? Well, the answer is obvious. If we choose a equals minus 1, and then so long as b is not 0, the longitudinal equation has no solutions. <laughs> I'll talk shortly about the case b equals 0. For this particular case, and this case only, our free wave equation has no four-dimensional longitudinal solutions. We have only transverse solutions. And they have a mass, which, since they're the only things around, I'll just call mu squared. Notice that this trick for suppressing the longitudinal solutions does not work when mu squared equals 0. When mu squared equals 0, if I set a equal to minus 1, then, in fact, I can have longitudinal oscillations of any mass whatsoever. 
because instead of getting no solutions, I have simply no restricting equation. K squared minus K squared plus 0 equals 0, or 0 equals 0. Well, that's unquestionably true, but doesn't restrict the longitudinal motions much. <laughs> For the remainder of this lecture, I will stick to the case mu squared not equal to zero. And I will talk later, I will, although I will occasionally make remarks about what happens as mu squared goes to zero. Thus, although we have three, two free parameters allowed by Lorentz invariance, when all is all the dust settles, we end up with one free parameter, which is a mass, if we are to get a theory that only possesses transverse solutions in the four-dimensional sense. I'll write down our Lagrangian, plus or minus, which we still have not determined. That will be fixed by the sign of the energy. D nu a mu, d nu a mu. Minus sign, I will now write the thing in the integrated by parts form. D nu a mu. D mu a nu, that's just the same term above, using the integration by parts identity plus minus mu squared a mu a mu. I've said a equal to minus 1 and b equal to minus mu squared. And integrated by parts, as I've said three times already on this term here. <laughs> I write it in this integrated by parts form because things become a little simpler that way. In particular, you see that if I fi define the combination f mu nu equals, here's a place where people always have different sign conventions. And unfortunately, Bjorkin and Drell do things this way. <laughs> d nu a mu minus d mu a nu. That particular combination. <clears throat> Then I can write this Lagrangian plus or minus one quarter f mu nu f mu nu minus mu squared a mu a mu. The reason being that this term with itself gives you this. And this term with itself also gives you this with the trivial reshuffling of indices. And the cross terms give you this. <clears throat> what? Mu squared at 1 half. Thank you. Slip this show. The, um, those of you who remember the discussion in either my 251 course or uh, uh, someplace else, in some course in E&M, of electromagnetic theory written in a relativistic form, will realize now why there's something special about the case mu squared equals 0. Because if I send mu squared to 0, this becomes nothing more or less than the Lagrangian for electromagnetism in appropriate units. If I interpret A0 as a scalar potential, and ai as the vector potential. This tells me that fij is diaj minus djai. That is to say, if I call fij the magnetic field, then uh, this, is, uh, this is simply the equation that the magnetic field is the curl of the vector potential. Likewise, f0i, zero time i space, is dia0, the gradient of the scalar potential, minus d0ai the familiar formula, gradient of scalar potential minus um, a time derivative of vector potential. And the Lagrangian with mu squared equals 0 simply becomes e squared minus h squared times a multiplying factor, the familiar Lagrangian for free electromagnetic theory. Thus, um, this is 
if mu goes to zero, this is free electromagnetic theory. And we now see why we have a, um, a no restraint on the, um, on the longitudinal part of the oscillations when mu equals zero, because that's simply what no, a longitudinal oscillation, what we've been calling a longitudinal oscillation, is simply what in conventional electromagnetic theory is called a gauge transformation. And as well known, you can add the gradient of the four-dimensional gradient of anything to the four-dimensional vector potential without any restraint whatsoever on anything. <laughs> Those who are unfamiliar with electromagnetic theory will have found the previous one minute of discussion incomprehensible and should ignore it. <laughs> Just take my word for it that the mu goes to zero limit of this is electromagnetic theory, free electromagnetism, written in relativistic form. And the reason we have such funny problems in this sort of thing as mu goes to zero is that the, if mu equals zero, the gauge invariance of electromagnetism pops in, and that is not present for this theory for any other value of mu. Mm. Are there any questions? There may be those who partially understand the electromagnetic theory who have questions about that point. Now, just as, no questions, just as an exercise, let me rederive the equations of motion. How far have I gotten? From uh, this form of Lagrangian. When I take a variational derivative with a mu, a mu enters this expression four times. Twice because it's, once it's an f mu nu, f upper mu nu, and f lower mu nu. And twice because it's twice an f mu nu. It's sitting there in f mu nu, and it's also sitting there in f nu mu. <laughs> Therefore, that variation will cancel out the four. Say, just look at one of these terms and vary with respect to this. And I get minus d nu f mu nu, varying that term with respect to a mu. The other one, the one half, is canceled. And I get mu squared a mu equals 0. These are the equations of motion written in terms of f mu nu. <clears throat> now I can instantly see the suppression of the longitudinal waves, because if I take the derivative of this thing with respect to mu, I find, I'm sorry, this shouldn't be plus, it should be minus. So I'll plus them both. <laughs> d nu, d mu, f mu nu, which equals 0 simply because f mu nu is anti-symmetric and d mu, d nu is symmetric, equals Thus we see that the divergence vanishes always, of course, assuming mu squared not equal to 0, <coughs> which is the suppression of longitudinal waves. This is simply the computation we've done before in Fourier space going through again in position space. By writing out the definition of f mu nu, we see this equation of motion can also be written as a d nu, a d nu a mu minus d mu a nu plus mu squared a mu equals 0. The central term vanishes because the divergence of a is 0, and the central term involves the divergence of a. So I simply have box squared a mu squared linearly independent solutions for any k, but we haven't asserted, told you what they are. I haven't told you what they are. And I'd like to establish some normalization conventions between the independent solutions, just as I established normalization conventions for the solutions of the Dirac equation.
therefore there will be, I remind you, three independent solutions, which are labeled by an index R, which runs from one to three. These are three independent vectors obeying the condition er dot k equals zero. Um, I will go to a frame in which k is at rest and normalize my solutions in that frame to be orthonormal vectors. I will call them ER of zero, the three solutions There are three space-like vectors. They could, for example, be the three unit vectors in uh, the x, y, and z direction. Minus sign, because of the minus sign in my metric, delta rs. That establishes my normalization condition. In fact, I don't want to necessarily restrict these e's to be real. There are some cases in which I will want them to be, for example, eigenstates of z rotation, in which case the good things to look at will be e z, e x plus i e y, and e x minus i e y. So I'll actually modify this slightly by putting a complex conjugate here. This is for the Dirac equation. I will define the solutions associated with a moving particle, if I may use such language, with a wave with k not equal to zero, by Lorent, applying an appropriate Lorentz boost. Lorentz. This is the inner product is Lorentz invariant. This is also true for those. For the Dirac equation, a normalization condition leads to a completeness equation, which involves in the Dirac equation, the useful operator, p slash, we learned from the last homework problem, I hope, how useful it was, p slash minus m, or p slash plus m, depending on whether one was looking at negative frequency or positive frequency solutions. Here also we have a normalization condition. A completeness, and we have a completeness relation, which is very easy to compute. For the case mu equals zero and nu equals zero, and I should complex conjugate here. These are three linearly independent three vectors. Therefore, when I sum them up, I should get the space in the rest frame. They have only got a space component. They have no zero component. That's the orthogonality or transversality condition. Therefore, when I sum them up, I should get delta ij if mu and nu are i or j, or equivalently, minus g mu nu, minus because of the minus sign in our metric. Unfortunately, this is not the whole story, because when mu and nu equal zero, this equation is a lie. I will take care of that by subtracting k mu k nu over mu squared. This equation is now true for all values of mu and nu, the spatial values because they're a complete set of three space vectors, and the time values because both the right and left hand side are zero in that case. A plus, I'm sorry, minus g0, zero, zero is one, this is one. By Lorentz invariant, this is also true for an arbitrary k. These are the analogs of the uh, p slash plus m that appears in the sum of u, u bar. And will be just as useful eventually in the second semester when we're summing over spins of emitted vector mesons. So much for the classical equation and its plane wave solutions. Are there any questions? I now turn 
to uh, canonical quantization, where we will see there will be some complications, quite apart from the fact that I will be juggling indices like crazy. As usual, I, in order to warm up for canonical quantization, I will find it convenient to break things up into space and time components. Therefore, the in, uh, Latin indices like i and j will run over the three space variables only, and I'll explicitly put out the time component. L equals plus or minus 1 half F0i, F0i, the 1 quarter comes and turns into a 1 half because I get the same term from 0i and i0, plus 1 quarter Fij, Fij, plus, no, I'm sorry, it was minus, wasn't it? Mu squared over 2, a upper i, a lower i, minus mu squared over 2, a0, a0, a fancy way of writing A0 squared. <laughs> now, F0i is the only term in here that involves a time derivative. Indeed, F0i is d naught ai minus di a naught. Fij only involves space derivatives. Therefore, <coughs> If we want to compute the canonical momentum density conjugate to AI, dl d d naught AI, we find, again, there are two identical terms which cancels the one half. Whoops, I'm sorry. Forgot my Burkean and Jarrell convention. <laughs> I find minus or plus f upper zero i. On the other hand, if I want to compute the momentum conjugate to A0, that's 0. Any question about the computation? It's just consequences that we're going to have to worry about in the next few minutes. Now, is this or is this not a disaster? Well, it is or is not a disaster, depending on whether AI and its conjugate momentum, F0i, is or is not a complete and independent set of initial value data. <clears throat> Let's work things out. I will demonstrate that it is, that in fact the entire initial value problem for solutions of the equation of motion of this system, <coughs> the entire set of initial value data is given in terms of AI and F0I. And therefore the fact that there is no momentum conjugate to A0 is totally irrelevant. Even if there were, we would have to throw it away because the complete and independent set would consist of AI and F0I all by themselves. Since we know that, in particular, everything obeys the Klein-Gordon equation, certainly a complete set of initial value data, things to give at a fixed time to characterize the solution, consists of AI and its time derivatives, and A0 and its time derivatives because the field and this time derivative were complete for the Klein-Gordon equation, and we just have four decoupled Klein-Gordon equations here. Therefore, our task is to show that at any fixed time, these things can be given in terms of AI and F0I. If we have done that, we will have demonstrated that that's enough. We don't need eight. We only need six functions. OK, let's go to work. So what we have is AI and F0I. 
Well, that certainly includes AI at the time zero, when we're putting up, or whatever fixed time we're imposing our initial value conditions. So that's OK. Secondly, we know as a consequence of the equations of motion, d mu a mu equals 0, or equivalently, d0 a0 equals minus di ai. Well, if I know ai at fixed time, I certainly know its divergence, and therefore I know d0 a0. That takes care of that one. Any question? Next step. Let's start out with the full form of the equation of motion. d nu f mu nu plus mu squared a mu equals 0. Can't fight that. Let's look at the component with mu equals 0. Since f is anti-symmetric, if I set mu equal to 0, nu can't also be 0. Well, it can, but then I get f0, 0, which is 0. So I only have a sum on spatial indices. di f0 i plus mu squared a0 equals 0, or a0 mu squared a0 equals minus di f0 i. That determines a0 in terms of f0i at fixed time. Finally, f0i equals di a0 minus d0 ai. And if I know already, say, I know a0 at fixed time, I know it's base derivative, so I know, and I know f0i, so I know d0 ai. This completes the argument. In fact, I don't need a0 and its time derivative. If I had them, it would be disgusting. I have a, a because I would be implying more initial conditions than I would be an independent set. I would be liable to ask you to solve an initial value problem which had no solution. Once I give f0i and ai at fixed time, I give all the comp I give all I need to know to compute the solution for all future time. Any questions about this? It's really just a transversality condition. If I didn't have my funny condition, little a equals minus 1, that I would have 4 degrees of freedom instead of just 3. I have that condition, so I have 3 degrees of freedom. I have three times as many solutions as the Klein-Gordon equation, and that should mean I should have three times as many functions to specify for the initial value problem. That's right. For the Klein-Gordon equation, I have to substitute, specify a field and its time derivative at time t equals 0. For this equation, I have to specify ai and f0i. It should be only 6 because 6 is 3 times 2, and I have 3 times as many solutions to the equation. <clears throat> now let's compute the Hamiltonian. same. The Hamiltonian density is the sum of PdQ, that's minus or plus F0i, Q dot, that's D0ai, minus L, where L is over there on the left-hand board. <coughs> now, and I've done the sum on the three things. Now, this is an awkward way of writing things for our purposes, because we want to write <coughs> everything in terms of p's and q's, that is to say, in terms of a's, a space part of a's and f's. So I'll substitute for this thing minus or plus 
no, plus or minus, excuse me, F zero I um, F zero I, because F zero I is essentially D naught A I, aside from a minus sign, <coughs> plus or minus, minus or plus, F zero I D I A zero, minus L. That's just sticking in the formula for D zero A I, in terms of F zero I, which I have right here on the center board. Now, all I'm really interested in is integrating the, the integral of the Hamiltonian density, which is the Hamiltonian, a space integral, so I can do this space integration by parts. If I do that, I'll get di F zero I, which I already know is minus mu squared A zero. I'll write things in terms of A0. We know A0 is shorthand for the divergence of F0i. That's fine. So plus or minus. Minus or plus, the two minus signs cancel. U squared A0 squared minus L. By an integration by parts, it's not the same thing, but it has the same space integral. This finds the same total Hamiltonian. Now we can assemble everything together, because here's L, and we're all set. Here I have F0i squared. Here I have it again with a 1 half. So I get plus or minus, I'll stick that in front, 1 half F0i, F0i. That takes care of the F0i terms. Then I have the Fij terms. from minus L. And then I have the AI terms from minus L. And then I have the A naught terms, which of course get their sign changed because of this. That's my Hamiltonian density. Any questions about this? Straightforward algebra, using the equations on the center board to do a little integration by parts. And of course, if I really want to express this as a function of p and q for a naught, I should write the thing obtained by this equation. But I'll just keep it as a naught for shorthand. Now we come to the question of positivity of the energy. All of these terms are, in fact, individually negative. This would be a square, except there's a minus sign when we raise a spatial index. And there's no minus sign when we raise a time index. So this is minus a square, a sum of squares. This is minus a sum of squares. We're raising two space indices, so we get two minus signs, which is a plus sign. This is negative definite, because we're raising one space index. And this is negative, because it's negative. <laughs> <laughs> so all four terms are negative, and therefore, to make if we choose the minus sign. Therefore, we can rewrite all of our equations without any plus or minus signs in them. L equals I'm going to run around 10 minutes over. L equals minus 1. I know you're all anxious to go to the secretary's office and pick up the final, but it won't be that bad. Minus 1 quarter F mu nu F mu nu plus mu squared over 2 A mu A mu. And this looks pretty much like we get for what we get for the scalar field, except the sign looks wrong. The sign looks wrong just because of our metric invention. Remember, the real dynamical variable is AI. A naught is a dependent variable in the sense of Hamiltonian dynamics. Therefore, 
if we, if we pull out the AI term, this is a negative sign times D0 A lower I, D0 A upper I, which is a positive sign times D0 A upper A lower I quantity squared because of the minus sign we get from raising and lowering a space index. So it's just like the conventional thing. T, L is T minus V. T is the term with time derivatives in it, and the term with time derivatives in it has a positive coefficient. The minus sign here is just an artifact introduced by the minus sign in the metric. Likewise, a typical V term like AI squared comes in here with a negative coefficient, just as it should, the negative coefficient being introduced by the metric rather than an explicit minus sign in front. The canonical momentum, while well, I have it here, minus or plus, and we've chosen plus. I'll just write that down here. Now, the, uh, we are now prepared to canonically quantize the theory. That will involve a range of indices, which I will go through quite rapidly in around six minutes. And then you will be all disgusted with me. And I don't want to end the course with you being disgusted with me, so I'll talk on for four minutes more <laughs> about a topic that is more amusing. Okay. Now, here comes the dull part. We want to impose the canonical quantization conditions, which tell us that at equal times, a lower i of x and t with its canonical momentum density, f0j, let me call it, of y and t equals i delta cubed of x minus y delta ij. Remember, with the delta, it doesn't matter whether it's upper or lower. I just write it that way to make it look pretty. <laughs> that is the canonical quantization condition. And I write, et cetera. I presume you know by now that q with q commutes and p with p commutes. And I don't have to write that down. Now, in order to shorten what is, in any case, an agonizing operation, I will write the field at any space-time point in terms of a sequence of Fourier coefficients with the usual thing in front. Since there are three momenta, there are three solutions for each momenta. I have three Fourier coefficients. plus Hermitian conjugate. It's a real field. Okay, this is just like what we did in the Dirac equation, except the field is real. We have these three Fourier coefficients, r equals 1 to 3. Uh, yes. Now, hmm? also on the pi, 3 halves. Excuse me. Now, I will demonstrate that if we assume for these things the naive commutation relations, that is to say those one would naturally guess, A R K A S K prime adjoint equals delta R S delta Q of K minus K prime. That is to say, just what we get from a scalar field. Then we deduce the proper canonical commutation relations. Okay. So it's just like the scalar field, except well, it's just like the Dirac field. Everything's got a uh, a, uh, a, a, uh, a the analog of a Dirac spinner hanging around with it, each annihilation and creation operator. But every otherwise, things are pretty much as you would expect. <coughs> now. This would be a horrendous computation because of all the indices around if I tried to do it directly. And therefore, I'll do a little bit of sneakiness. Okay. 
you're worth looking at, comes in in realizing that we, when we did a free scalar field, we found the time we paid it for arbitrary times. was an invariant function, depending on the mass, which I suppress, called capital delta. <coughs> we also knew that at equal times, delta equals 0, d naught delta is minus delta cubed of x minus y. And d naught squared delta equals 0, where d mu, since there are two variables around, I'd better specify which one I'm differentiating with, is d by dx mu. So this is the fact that q with q is 0. This is the fact that p with q is a minus the delta function. And this is the fact that p with p is 0. Okay. Now. We already did that. Okay. So the computation we've got to do here to compute this one is exactly the same, except that in Fourier's case, after we've commuted everything, we've also got a sum on r. For each value of r, it's the same computation as we did there. We have a sum on r, which will come in, some sum, e mu r e nu r star for each value of k in Fourier space, which we know is minus g mu nu plus k mu k nu over mu squared. That's our normalization condition, our completeness relation. So we'll get exactly the same Fourier transform as before from doing this commutator as in the other commutator. The only thing is that in Fourier space, this thing will be stuck inside. Well, it's very easy to translate this operator from Fourier space to position space. K mu is i d by dx. Therefore, without having to do any computations at all, we know that this is going to be minus g mu nu minus d mu d nu over mu squared delta of x minus y. OK, that saves us a lot of labor. No reason to do a calculation twice when you've already done it once. <laughs> now, having this information, we can just evaluate this thing at equal times and differentiate it to find out what f mu nu is, the commutator with f mu nu, and see if it gives us the right answer. First step. Zero. Why does it give us zero? Because at equal times, delta is zero. And the space, therefore, a fortiori, the space derivatives of delta are 0. That's right. That's q with q equals 0. Any questions? Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> it's i and j. Okay. a0 with ai doesn't commute at equal times. Can't be. a0 is some awful divergence of a canonical momentum density. Onwards. Uh, don't want to erase this. Ah, don't need this. Need this. We've done this. That's taken care of itself. OK, next step is to differentiate this and get f mu nu. Hmm, shouldn't call it mu nu. Should call it mu lambda, I guess, because I've already got a new here. OK, that's d lambda a mu. Pretty easy. 
I, g mu nu, d lambda, minus d lambda, d mu, d nu, over mu squared. That's all going to be times the delta. And then I want to anti-symmetrize with respect to mu and lambda. So I have minus g lambda nu, d mu, plus d mu, d lambda, d nu, over mu squared, the whole thing, times delta of x minus y. These two terms cancel, because d mu, d lambda is d lambda, d mu. So it looks pretty simple. Let's work it out. F zero j a i. x naught equals y naught. Well, <clears throat> let's see. Mu is 0, lambda is i, nu is, lambda is j, nu is i. Well, <clears throat> this term is nothing. That's a 0 with an i. That gives us nothing. This term gives us minus g i j. So I have minus i g i j d0 delta, because mu is 0, which is minus delta cubed of x minus y. Now either get the right sign or you'll hear me scream. <laughs> Let's see. Firstly, uh, to compare this with this, I'm going to get the wrong sign. You're going to hear me. Oh, oh sorry. Minus plus. It was minus originally. Oh, minus, minus. <laughs> okay. Now, this thing differs from the canonical form in that the commutator is switched in order and a j is upstairs instead of downstairs. That's two minus signs, which is a plus sign. This gets a minus sign from here and also a minus sign because g lower ij is minus delta ij. <laughs> After that triumph, and because there is one other point I want to discuss, I will leave it to you to show that F0i with F0j is 0. It's a trivial extension of what we have done so far. And also to show that the Hamiltonian is what it should be. I'll write that down explicitly. a divergent constant, which as usual we drop. Okay. That's straightforward following the line I have set up. You can do it if you've understood what I've done so far. Neither of them is particularly complicated computations, although both are a tiny bit tedious. Now, before I let you go, this is the last lecture, so you must allow me a few minutes of overtime. Before I let you go, I want to discuss something more interesting then this dumb commutate com computational commutator. I'll pass to the ground too to make sure we haven't had any crazy sign errors or normalization mistakes. But once you've done it once, you've done it once, and you never have to think about it again. I'd like to discuss something that has a little bit more physics in it. I'd like to discuss how an actual physical process is affected as the mass of this meson, this real vector meson, goes to zero. Well, I can't talk about a very complicated theory because I don't even know what the propagator is. However, I haven't computed that yet. However, there is one theory I can discuss. I can discuss the analog of our model one before, in which I have a C number source, J mu, some arbitrary function of x vanishing at infinity, coupled to A mu. And I can discuss the process where that C number source emits one meson. Here it is. That's the Feynman graph. We talked about that Feynman graph in the scalar theory. We've just got the same graph. Now we can think. Before I do that, let me write down the Heisenberg equation of motion. D nu F mu nu 
plus u squared a mu plus j mu, sorry, it should be j lower mu, equals zero. That's the equation of motion. And let me at least ask that that have a sensible zero mass limit. Let's diver diverge this equation. <laughs> I've invented, I see, a new verb. <laughs> okay. Now, this thing is always zero. If this is to make any sense at all, when I set mu squared equal to zero, I had better have d mu j mu equals zero, otherwise everything is going to go bananas. <laughs> so I will consider not a general external current, but a conserved current. So I can at least talk sensibly about what this theory is with mass zero. That's my one condition. Now, what is the amplitude for emission of a meson R and type and momentum of type R with momentum K? Well, we sort of know what happens from our old scalar case. The amplitude for one meson emission will be the thing that stands in front of the meson creation operator, which is the conjugate of this thing. I could really put these upper and lower. It'll make my later equations look neater. Times the Fourier transform of this thing with k. Maybe it's not equal. Maybe it's proportional. I don't care. There's some kinematic factors, but it looks like this. It's got to look like this. If there were only one field, we just get the Fourier transform of the scalar source. We all remember that. We now have four fields, so we've got to sum over the four fields. And this tells you exactly how you have to sum to make a meson of the desired sort. Is everyone happy with this formula? Now, I see a smile. Everyone is happy. <laughs> we also have, by our conservation condition, OK? Now, <clears throat> let's consider a meson with fixed momentum. And there's a fixed, nice, smooth, continuous function, j mu twiddle of k. And I'll take that momentum to have point in the z direction with some magnitude k. And of course, therefore, it has energy k squared minus mu squared. I'm going to consider what happens as I let the mass go to 0 while keeping the momentum fixed and non-zero, of course. I get very funny things if I let the mass go to zero while the system is in its rest frame. <laughs> so I want to consider, ultimately, the limit mu over k, that's a nice dimensionless number, goes to zero. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> I will do this for three independent kinds of mesons that can be emitted. Remember these e's are restricted to be orthonormal space-like vectors. Therefore, I'll take E1 and all orthogonal to k. This is a unit vector in the x direction. It's orthogonal to k and of unit magnitude. This is a unit vector in the y direction. These are more properly a linear combination of them with described states with helicity plus and minus 1, x plus i, y, and x minus i, y. And then there's one that's unchanged, the helicity zero meson. That's unchanged by rotations about the z-axis, the direction of the three momentum. And that will be, well, it's got to be only no x and y components. They got to be zero. It's got to be orthogonal to this one. Well, that's easy to arrange. I'll put a square root of k squared plus mu squared here, and a k here. And then the minus sign, the metric, will make everything orthogonal. And to make it of unit norm, I'd better multiply it by 1 over mu. Otherwise, it will have, in, it will have norm mu squared, which is minus mu squared, which is not good. Now, <clears throat> I'm now ready to go. I'm going to show you that something very interesting happens to the amplitude for emitting a meson of this kind as mu goes to 0, a helicity 0 meson. <clears throat> k 
zero, let's look at this equation. J zero twiddle, which is square root of k squared plus mu squared, plus k j three twiddle equals zero. The amplitude for emitting a meson of type three, one characterized by that, is one over mu from the one over mu in front. K J zero twiddle plus root K squared plus mu squared J three twiddle. Notice in general if mu is not being sent to zero, it's a completely different combination than this. Now let's put this equation in here. Describe everything in terms of J zero twiddle. K from the first term, J3 twiddle is K squared plus mu squared over, okay, so that's K squared plus mu squared over K. Now we notice an amazing cancellation arising, K minus K, mu over mu, equals mu over script K, the J0 twiddle. Okay, nothing has been involved in this but elementary algebra. Now, it is quite true that no matter how small mu is, this is a system with three degrees of freedom. Even if mu, yes, sir. Where, here? No, these, I've always arranged it so upper with lower, upper with lower, so there's no. Oh, my, oh, over there, yes. This is always a system with three degrees of freedom, okay? Suppose the photon had a mass, if everyone says the photon is massless, but suppose it had a mass of 10 to the minus 30th, the electron mass, okay? A very hard thing one would imagine to detect experimentally. Some people say, no, absolutely not. It would be trivial to detect experimentally because we know the real massless photon has only got two degrees of freedom, polarized light and everything. So if we took an oven, and uh, you know, let things come to thermal equilibrium because the walls of the oven are radiating and absorbing photons. We wouldn't get the Planck law. We get a Planck law times three halves because when we measured the entropy of the oven, because there are three degrees of freedom. So that's it. We know absolutely the mass is zero. This is garbage, as this shows you, <laughs> because the amplitude for the wall of the oven, as indicated by this current, to radiate a helicity zero meson goes to zero as mu over k goes to zero. At every stage in the limiting process, there are indeed three degrees of freedom, just as you would expect for a massive vector meson. But as mu over k goes to zero, the amplitude for emitting the third photon goes to zero. The photon mass is small enough, it will require 20 trillion years for that oven to reach thermal equilibrium. <laughs> okay, it's because it's just got a very, very tiny amplitude for any individual atomic transition simulated here by this external current emitting the third kind of photon. Thus we see something very interesting. At least for this very simple process, emission of a single meson by an external source Although our whole formalism collapses completely as mu goes to zero, if we go to the end and compute a physically reasonable process, we find that the amplitude of physically reasonable process goes to, well, I haven't given or done electrodynamics explicitly, that'll be the second semester, goes to what you would expect, if you know anything about electrodynamics, to be the electrodynamic answer. This vector meson of mass 10 to the minus 23rd times the electron mass looks just like a photon. You shake your source, despite the fact that it has three degrees of freedom, only with, except for a negligible factor, only helicity plus one and minus one are emitted. There is no amplitude to emit helicity zero. Well, I wanted to end with that, so I would give, are there any questions about that? Yes, sir. What Black body, yeah. Black body is, turns out to be not the best way. 
The best way is uh, to look at, nor is uh, the fact that the diffusion law is not perfect, that quanta of different wavelengths have different velocities, particularly good, because you can get a better one elsewhere. The best way is the Coulomb law, which would be modified into a Yukawa law, or the analog for dipoles. It turns out, although there are magnetic fields over cosmic distances, this is actually interesting, although there are magnetic fields over cosmic distances, these are not good because the Compton wavelength, sorry, the, the, um, the bi wavelengths for the interstellar or intergalactic interstellar plasma it messes things up, and that gives the characteristic radius. The best measurement is that made by the satellite Explorer 12 at night, <laughs> <laughs> which measured the magnetic dipole field of the Earth and saw that it was a magnetic dipole at night because in the daytime, Explorer 12 is in the solar wind. In the nighttime, the Earth shields Explorer 12 from the solar wind, and plasma effects are much reduced. At night, it, at day, it doesn't measure a dipole field, but that's because you've got plasma effects from the solar wind. At night, it's 10,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth and measures a dipole field with something like 10 or 15% accuracy. And therefore, a number on the order of 10,000 kilometers is the current best lower bound on the Compton wavelength of the photon. This is quite large. In fact, that 10 to the minus 23rd, I told you, was an exaggeration, was an underestimate, since, as you recall, the Compton wavelength of the electron is around, what, 10 to the minus 21st centimeters. Over 10,000 kilometers is, well, you can figure it out, around 10 to the 30th times lighter than the electron. But that's as good as we can do. It could have that as a finite rest mass. <laughs> that's the answer to your question, the end of the semester. Come back next semester. <laughs>